It's my very, very great pleasure to introduce the 2014 Redfield Award winner, Gene Likens. Um, I'd never worked with Gene, or at least we, we published together, but I, I never actually was in his lab. He, I visited the Institute of Ecosystem Studies once, and he sat me down, and we had a nice chat for a while, but I was just totally in awe. I could just gibbering idiot, and so, so I quickly exited without embarrassing myself too badly. Um, G G Gene's influence on, on, on science actually cannot be overstated. It's not just 1,400 reviewed publications. It's not hundreds of graduate students graduated and mentored. It, it's, it's more about how he looked at the world, I think, and, and how he has, has always tried to do something a little bit different. He was one of the very first limnologists to go to the Antarctic and think about Dry Valley Lakes. When you think about acid rain, Gene Lichen's work is right there, absolutely front and center. And then when you think about trying to create something different, something lasting, you can't help but look at the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies or the Hubbard Brook uh, project, which is now entering its 50th year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, these are achievements that individually would be outst outstanding and astounding, but together they're just incomprehensible. They're incomprehensible to me. Even his very last book, the, written with, with uh, Tom Winters, I, I actually read the whole thing, not because I have any particular love of groundwater, I don't dislike it, it just, uh, but because I knew there was something in there that I needed to know about, and he actually taught me how to think about ecosystem regulation, about the doing ma using mass balances to think about what fluxes controlled ecosystem processes on a scale that mattered at the entire ecosystem. And, and I think it's this latter piece, this ecosystem study, ecosystem concept, and it, not just its application or development, but actually just living the concept and showing how it was relative, relevant to society is what's made Gene's work so incredibly influential. So there's the straight publication numbers, 1,480 reviewed papers, hundreds of of, of uh, PhD, well, over 100 PhD, uh, 70 master's students, 20 books, 20 books. I've never read 20 books, uh, never mind write them. Uh, and, and Gene's influence is, is pervasive, it's profound, and, and, and also, though, it's personal. He has trained many of the eminent scientists who you'll see on this stage and speaking throughout the, throughout the meeting. Uh, he's been absolutely influential in how science is not just translated. It's so easy to say, oh, we gotta be, you know, bring our science to the public. Gene doesn't, doesn't, doesn't talk the talk, he walks the walk. He's a presidential advisor on, on issues relating to the environment. He's, his research is fundamental in restructuring legislation and, and changing how we protect the environment. I, I really, I, could, I, would, I would go on, but I, I'd like Gene to speak about his own work. Uh, just to say, though, that, that his, his work with the Hubbard Brook and his work with uh, ecosystem studies is one of the most transformative bodies of science on the planet. And with that, I'd like you to welcome Gene Likens, the AC Redfield Career Lifetime Award Achievement Winner. Thank you, Peter, for that uh, really kind introduction. I am uh, very honored and pleased to be the recipient of the uh, Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I did think, Peter, it was a little bit over the top that um, Aslo um, labeled the whole meeting uh, in my honor, something about Gene's ecosystems. Oh, no, I didn't read that right. It's, um, any rate, seriously, I'm very humbled by this um, award, um, especially because of uh, Redfield. When I was president of ASLO in 1981-82, um, I had the idea that it would really be nice to honor some of the um, old past presidents and I did that, and Redfield was um, dying in Woods Hole. So my wife and I went to Woods Hole 
with a letter of appreciation from the society, and I delivered it to him in his bed. I wasn't in his bed, but he was. <laughs> and I delivered it to him and still remember clearly the twinkle in his eye uh, that Aslo hadn't forgotten him as a past president of our organization. So it's a special uh, humbleness that I uh, accept this award. Um, my scientific passion is water and has been since I was uh, a child. And I've had the great fortune um, to be able to work on all forms of water in all stages of water, from precipitation to uh, streams and rivers and lakes and groundwater, as um, Peter said, uh, from an ecosystem point of view. And this has been just a wonderful uh, lifetime uh, activity that I've been uh, had the pleasure of doing. Um, this first slide, is it up? Yeah. This first slide was taken, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I think 1965. And we're uh, sitting on the front porch of Pleasant View Farm at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, talking about science. And I'm there, I was 28 years old, uh, actually 29 maybe in this picture. Um, looking out from the back porch is Herb Borman. Uh, to his left is Robert Whitaker, and the other person in the front is um, uh, George Woodwell. And we spent many hours talking about how we should do science. We were trying to study ecosystems, and they're very compl complicated and complex, and we didn't know how to do it. So we would spend many hours talking about how we could get our minds around these complicated systems. Four of us started the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study. Um, we're shown here. Robert Pierce was with the US Forest Service. Herb Borman and I and Noe Johnson were all at Dartmouth College. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my three colleagues have deceased, and it sometimes feels kind of lonely, I must say, uh, and I miss them uh, very greatly. We had fun. On our 25th anniversary, uh, we, uh, we had a party. We de de decorated the uh, lawn in front of the Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest with toilet paper as a big 2-5, and we had to do a can-can. So, I don't know about Pierce, he seems to be out of sync. I hadn't noticed that before, but uh, he was. Hubbard Brook is located in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in sort of the middle of a large northern hardwood forest biome, and it has been a wonderful place to work for a very long time. We, this summer in June, celebrated 50 years of continuous study with funding continuously from the National Science Foundation and it's been a great run. What I want to do today very briefly is give you a few vignettes of some of this work, some of it you've seen before, some of it you have not, and to talk about the things that have really excited me uh, in this lifetime. I hope my life isn't over, but in this lifetime of research. We have been trying to push our records back. The world didn't start in 1963 when we started the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study. We know that. And so we've been trying to push our records back with hind casting so we have a better perspective and framework for what is going on currently. This is an example of uh, the water flux from 1900 to 2010. Um, and we're able to do that by taking records from nearby stations that have longer records going back to 1900 and then developing uh, correlations with our data. They have very high R square values, higher than 85. Um, and so they're relatively good. You can see the error limits on this graph. One of the things is I wanted to point out here is that we've had a very sharp increase in 
uh, precipitation. It's much wetter at Hubbard Brook today than it was uh, when we started. In fact, when we started, we were in a drought, one of the driest periods in 200 years in the White Mountains and much of New England. Uh, but we're in a much different uh, situation, uh, presumably due to climate change. We don't know for sure, but presumably due to climate change. But it's a different situation. So when I think back 50 years, what it was like, and now, I have to think about it in a very different way. And when you study a complicated ecosystem, this can be very difficult to do. Our very first sample of precipitation was collected on the 24th of July, 1963, and it had a pH of 3.7. We were shocked because we hadn't expected it to be that acid. We had no idea why it should be that acid. We thought maybe it was because um, we were in a granitic state, <laughs> state of New Hampshire, and maybe that was a part of the reason that it was so acidic. We did not know. Uh, the full year had a weighted, volume weighted average of 4.12, very acid. Many of our rainstorms um, were 100 times more acidic than we expected them to be if it were not polluted. Um, this was really sort of the discovery of acid rain in North America, but we didn't know what it was all about. The lowest pH we've ever measured at Hubbard Brook was 2.85, and it caused necrotic spots on the leaves. It wasn't talk about serendipity. My whole life has been governed by serendipity. It wasn't until I changed jobs, moved from Dartmouth College to Cornell University, and I set up collectors around the Finger Lakes to measure precipitation chemistry and found that they were almost the same, and that's what this figure shows, as we had been measuring in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And that was our first clue that this might be a regional problem rather than some local aberration occurring at Hubbard Brook in the White Mountains. We didn't publish our first paper on acid rain until 1972, so the first sample 1963, aha, what is going on? And it took us until 1972 before we published the first paper. And the first paper's title was Acid Rain. We didn't know at that time that that term had been used before in England, but uh, we debated a long time about should we call this paper uh, acid precipitation in New England, or should we talk about uh, what is the effect? And we finally decided to call it acid rain. And that title had huge impact in terms of communication and in terms of reaction. I remember giving a lecture once at UC Davis in Sacramento, um, and um, I was uh, interviewed by a reporter, and the next morning the paper headline said, Prof says rain on acid trip. <laughs> well, that's the kind of, of uh, you want publicity, not notoriety, but uh, it all uh, fed into a long story about uh, acid rain. With um, federal regulations, the 1970 amendments, the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act, uh, the acidity of rainfall has declined. Here's a long-term record. Each dot on this figure is an annual average. Uh, you can see many ups and downs, and there are many stories there. But two points I want to make about this figure very quickly. One is it took us 18 years of continuous measurement in order to fit a linear regression to those data to say simply the rain is less acid than it was, 18 years. The other point is that we are still two, three, four times more acidic today, uh, even with the decline, than we should be if the atmosphere were not polluted. So we'll continue to monitor uh, this parameter and see how it changes. This is a plot of 
the sum of base cations on the vertical scale and the sum of acid anions on the horizontal scale. And we started in 1963, but we didn't start there. So we came from some point, pre-industrial revolution uh, point. And we don't know where that was. We worked very hard and are working currently to try to understand where that is. But we came down from that point somewhere through an acidification up until 63 and then 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, and 69. Those were the acidification years. And then in 1970, with the, um, the amendment to the air pollution, um, to the uh, uh, Air Act, um, it turned around. And now it's on a very robust trajectory toward recovery. Uh, just crossed the one-to-one -one line where the acid neutralizing capacity is positive uh, in about 1999, uh, 2000. It, it bounces around a little, but a very robust, robust line. And it looks to us like it isn't going back to where we thought the pre-industrial revolution number uh, was before. And I'll come back to that point uh, in a moment. Uh, this point has been made by many people, but I think it can't be overemphasized. It takes a long time. It took a long time after Rachel Carson talked about DDT before we did something about it. It took a long time for us to ban lead in gasoline. It took a long time for us to ban smoking, uh, or at least to um, talk about its, its uh, severe health problems and to reach a point where decisions are make, made, you need to have fundamental information. Basic is a bad pun. You need to have fundamental information in order to be uh, credible to uh, decision makers. Uh, in the case of acid rain in the US, uh, it took three presidents and one pope and 27 years before we passed legislation. So from that first sample in 1963 until uh, uh, we passed legislation specifically to uh, reduce acid rain, 27 years. Um, I and a small group briefed President Reagan and the full cabinet for an hour in 1983 to no avail. Instead, it was decided to study the problem rather than to deal with the problem. Uh, and it wasn't until George Bush the second that, I'm, I'm sorry, the first, that um, action was taken and the uh, 1990 Clean Air Act amendments were passed. Why the Pope? Well, we had a week-long meeting at the Vatican talking about air pollution and acid rain. And at the end of that meeting, we gave a report to the Pope he listened carefully, was convinced, and issued an encyclical. Could be that that encyclical uh, was more effective than much or maybe all of the science that we ever did. But nevertheless, uh, that was uh, a part of the overall story. So the acid rain problem has not been solved. And I don't have time today to talk about the effect of the acidity from the atmosphere leaching out the base cations from the soil. At Hubbard Brook, uh, approximately 50% of base cations, calcium and magnesium, have been leached by the soil, from the soil by acid rain, which makes those systems, having lost their buffering capacity, much more sensitive to the acid rain that's still coming. So there's less of it, but the systems are more sensitive, so the effect is greater. So arguably, it's uh, more serious than it was, uh, we thought it was in 1970 or 1980 or even 1990. One of the, the I don't know if joy is the right word uh, in my scientific career, is that I've had the rare opportunity, maybe even a unique opportunity as a scientist, to be there at the point of discovery aha, this rain is acid, it shouldn't be acid, how did it get that way? All the way through the many years, the 27 years, to the point where decision makers made decisions
to reduce acid rain. So that's, um, that's one of the highlights of, of my career. Uh, Hubbard Brook, we monitor uh, precipitation uh, and its chemistry, water stream flow, and its chemistry uh, year-round. Um, both precipitation and stream water with these base cations, calcium and magnesium, shown here, um, declined significantly from the time we started until um, the late 70s or 80s. And I worked very hard, as did others, to initiate uh, federal monitoring programs for precipitation and stream water and lake chemistry, which are now in place. But they started about 1978, 1980, depending upon which system, which element. Uh, our data suggests that a lot of the action was over by then. So, I'm, you know, it's good we had that earlier data, but what does that mean? And we have some answers to that, but there are still many questions to be resolved. One of the aspects of Hubbard Brook that I think probably most are familiar with is that we've done whole system manipulations, whole watersheds and whole streams. And there's an interesting bit of history. Um, Chauncey Jude at University of Wisconsin was one of the earliest to do experimental manipulations. He dumped fertilizer in lakes and he wanted to increase the fish production. His student Hassler, Arthur Hassler, uh, did experiments uh, on lakes pumping in uh, air and turning them over and, and adding lime and trying to precipitate uh, DOC and so forth. And I was Hassler's student. At the Experimental Lakes area, uh, Wally Johnson uh, was a Hassler student. So in two of the areas where experimental manipulation of whole systems, there is that trace back history to Jude, which I think is kind of interesting. So one of our first experiments, our first big experiment, was the cutting of uh, an entire watershed. We cut all the trees, we left them in place. It was not a harvest, harvest operation, it was just an experiment. We wanted to know what would happen to the system if we, if we destroyed the trees, which we did. The results uh, were um, partly expected. We expected there'd be more water runoff because we'd removed all the transpiration uh, from the, the, the leaves. And at Hubbard Brook, transpiration is about 70% of evapotranspiration, so it's a big number. But what we didn't expect um, is that the nitrate concentrations would increase. And the reason I show you this figure, and, and I think many of you know this story, the reason I show this figure is that I'm very proud of this figure. This was made in 1968 when you had to uh, take a picture of the graph that you'd made and you then mounted the negative and took a felt marking pen and colored in the lines. It took me longer to scan this, uh, this old slide and make it digitally available to use uh, than it did for me to make it in the old way. At any rate, so the nitrate concentration jumped way up, way above drinking water limits, declined the second summer, and then went almost two times the drinking water limits. And that was a total surprise to us and led to decades of research trying to understand what was going on and why. Many other uh, d disturbances caused the same result. This is a very complicated figure, and I apologize uh, about that. The, the red line, which maybe you can see on your left, going way off scale is that, that result from the cutting of Watershed 2. But then all the other ups and downs are due to things like soil frost and um, ice storms and wind storms and um, different kinds of effects. And one of the most surprising aspects of all this is that we had no idea that these would uh, be different in different systems, and they are. So we now have major research trying to understand why is that? These watersheds are side by side. We thought they were good reference watersheds, and they probably are, but they respond differently, and why? So what are the legacies of past disturbance 
that make them respond so differently. Sorry, I don't have more time to talk. I said I'm just giving you some brief vignettes. One of the elements that we then have focused a lot on is nitrate. And this long-term record of nitrate in precipitation and stream water from an undisturbed watershed is very interesting. The nitrate concentration in precipitation uh, when we began went up, and you can kind of see that. These are, uh, it's a busy graph because these are all the data went up and we thought, oh wow, the nitrate is increasing dramatically. We published a couple papers on that. Well, as you can see, that didn't last very long. And currently it has gone down primarily because of uh, air pollution regulation relative to ozone management, not acid rain, ozone management. And the values today are, are currently at or lower than they were in 1963-64 when we started. Same way with stream water. It has gone up and down, and currently the nitrate concentrations in stream water are the lowest on record. In the summertime, we can barely measure them. They're barely above detection level. So I'm an ecosystem scientist, a biogeochemist that likes to deal with trying to put it all together as best I can. So this is a mass balance diagram for nitrogen. And it's for every year of our study, 50 years of our study. And all of the components, including the inputs in precipitation, gaseous exchange, dry deposition, all those are above the line as inputs. Below the line are losses. Stream water, um, again, gaseous, you could have gaseous uptake, all of the losses and biomass uptake. And so that's done every year. And the black line is the sum of all those inputs and outputs. And so you can see that for nitrogen, there's been a huge change. In the first uh, two decades or so of our work, the system was losing nitrogen and currently it's gaining nitrogen for the last three decades or so. But right now, it seems like it's maybe headed toward a lost side again. So lots of questions, lots of opportunities to uh, do further research. One of the, the new, uh, very interesting findings is that both precipitation and stream water are going to extremely dilute levels. The R squares on these regressions are uh, well above 0.85. And if you extrapolate the, the, the trends, you go to zero in only a few years. Well, um, you can't imagine distilled water, or demineralized water in a stream. But that's what these data show. So what's going to happen? So we, we modeled what we thought would happen when it got to some low value and then level off. And those are shown on the graph. Um, but what will happen? And it's not going to be that very long in the distance before we will know what happened. And what's causing these dramatic declines in concentration? Well, for precipitation, it's largely due to the federal control on emissions. So the less emissions, there's less sulfate, uh, there's less dust, so there's less calcium on and on. So it's getting cleaner. For stream water, we've leached so much calcium and magnesium out of the soils, there's much less to be there to, to come out uh, from the system. So it's becoming very dilute. This is one that I think is maybe one of the most interesting, um, maybe important findings from the 50-year study at Hubbard Brook. Um, Judy, do you see yourself? Um, we worked together uh, to do our research, very different than today. Uh, some of you might recognize Bruce Peterson, uh, Judy Meyer, uh, Rhoda Walter. Um, we would all get together and clean out the weirs for uh, cooperative efforts. We did a lot of stream manipulations, and I don't have time to talk about them, but 
We manipulated organic debris dams. We manipulated nitrogen, phosphorus, DOC, acid, alkalinity, aluminum, light and shade, in-stream retention, uh, stable isotope additions. We did a lot of whole stream manipulations uh, that turned out to be really very interesting. I invited all of my former uh, grad students and postdocs and colleagues that had worked on um, uh, streams at Hubbard Brook to come back. My first student was Stuart Fisher. Uh, you might see him there right in the middle. Um, they came back for a long weekend. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we worked and we published a paper about what had changed in the time since Stuart Fisher was there and and currently, so it was a really fun and productive effort. One of the mysteries is um, uh, ongoing. For probably two decades, we had no um, algae in the streams, and nobody would believe that. I remember Ruth Patrick saying to me, well, Gene, there's got to be algae in those streams. There are no streams without algae. And Ruth, there are no algae in the streams. We've looked very hard. Come look yourself. She never did. We looked very hard, and we never found any algae at all. And then in the mid-'80s, algae started appearing. And today, we have algal blooms, but only during that short period between when the snow melts and the canopy comes on, the light period, so-called vernal window. Um, so that's a puzzle. Why? What's going on there? Um, watershed 4 shows some of that algae that was collected, but here's Watershed 1. I don't have any time to talk about this. There's a whole watershed that we added a buffer to wollasinite. Um, calcium silicate has no algae in it, by and large. So we're wondering what's going on there. There's a poster here. Richard Marinos um, uh, has a poster that you can go quiz him about uh, why this is happening. Uh, very interesting changes over the long, long period. Very quickly on Mirror Lake, uh, we've done a, a lot of work on Mirror Lake, then two books on Mirror Lake. Um, um, who knows who this is? Anybody? Yeah, John Cole. <laughs> yeah, John Cole would load up his little red wagon with his oars and his ice chest and um, go to Mirror Lake. This is from uh, a short walk from Pleasant View Farm. Um, we've been keeping track of things. I'd started this as a hobby uh, in the early 60s of the ice on, ice off period. And we have a strict protocol, so we can do that within two days or one day. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty good record. And the, the period of ice cover was shrinking rather dramatically, as you can see from the, the early part of the curve. And then it got more variable. And currently, it's very variable. It's just going like this. Um, and this year, we were a week late in ice off. That's that point you see uh, at the end of the graph. Um, so it's, a, it's back up, not really any different from it was in the early 60s. You know, what's going on? Uh, we've published some ideas, but what's going on? Why, why is it now so much more variable, and particularly in the last uh, four or five years, just swinging back and forth like this when Ice cover is really one of those uh, good indicators of uh, heat budget for a lake. So heat budgets and circulation is one of my um, uh, real loves. Uh, and we discovered, this is Noe Johnson, we discovered that we could measure the temperature of sediments uh, below the water uh, mud interface very accurately and very easily with a probe and uh, we discovered that we could measure within two to three meters below the mud water interface the geothermal gradient for the area. And geologists had been going into deep caves and caverns and whatnot to try to get to that um, consistency uh, before, and now we could do it really very easily. 
I once asked G. Ulan Hutchinson, um, what, what do you consider the most uh, important thing you did in your career? And I expected him to say, oh, the, the niche idea or, or something like that. He didn't. He said, well, I suppose it was my work on the Connecticut heat budgets. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> uh, yes. I said, why? Well, as you know, biology is so variable and physics is not. <laughs> as true. Um, and then we've done a lot of uh, paleo work. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that at all, but I did want if any of you can see two of my colleagues and uh, shown in this picture, one is Clyde Goulden uh, sitting in the boat and the other is Margaret Davis lying in the boat, hard at work watching cores being taken on Mirror Lake. So uh, Margaret Davis is a dear friend, but if you ever thought she worked out, no, I'm kidding, she works very, very hard. So I would like very much to say uh, heartfelt Thanks to Aslo for this award. And I wanted to make a final point, if I might. I see I'm a little bit over my time. Uh, and that is that, you know, one of the real joys of being a scientist is that you don't have to stop. As long as you have uh, an ability to, to uh, be curious, to ask questions, to observe, to have fun, which is very important, and your brain works a little bit, you can still do science. You don't have to have huge grants and huge devices. Yes, they're nice for some things we do, but you don't have to have them. The picture of, of Stan Dodson, it's the question asking and the having fun which gives us as scientists this remarkable opportunity to never stop doing what we truly love. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Now I want to um, invite all of you to please join us at the ASLO Membership Fair. It's in uh, section 251 of the Portland Ballroom. We're going to toast the uh, awardees. We're going to have uh, food. It's, everything's free and beverages. And because it's ASLO, there will be adult beverages there. So um, please come out and join us. Thank you very much.